Thank you. Today, we've heard many stories of courage, of struggle, of triumph, and of defeat, and most of all, of trauma. I'm here today to share the news that there's new hope for the treatment of trauma. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a debilitating condition after exposure to a traumatic event or a series of traumatic events. The symptoms include re-experiencing, coming back in nightmares, intrusive thoughts during the day, avoidance, people avoid reminders or triggers of the trauma. There's often emotional numbing, fear, depression, and hypersensitivity, hypervigilance, and all of this combines into a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. More people than you might imagine actually suffer from PTSD. Six to 10 percent of all people will develop PTSD at some point during their lifetime. And more so if you're working for human rights or struggling against oppressive regimes or if you're a veteran. Right now, there's about one million veterans that are receiving disability payments for PTSD from the Veterans Administration at a cost of around $20 billion a year. According to the Open Global Society, a survey was conducted of human rights workers that shows that 18% of human rights workers have PTSD and another 18% suffer from symptoms a little bit short of a diagnosis. That's a staggering number. 38% of human rights workers, and even more so sometimes of the people that they're trying to help, are struggling with trauma and they don't have available to them the most effective treatments. Only 40 to 60 percent of people with PTSD respond to the currently available treatments. That's an enormous amount of suffering. The currently available treatments include primarily pharmacotherapy, drugs such as Zoloft and Paxil, that address the symptoms but not the root cause, that require daily administration, often for months, years, or decades, or a lifetime, that have significant side effects, and that really don't leave people feeling much better. There's also psychotherapies, and these work well for quite a few people, but they're very difficult because they require confronting the trauma, and for many people that's too difficult, and so there's a lot of dropouts from the currently available psychotherapies. For the last 30 plus years, I've been working to develop a new innovative treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, which comes from the psychedelic drug called MDMA. MDMA was invented in 1912 by Merck Pharmaceutical Company, but they didn't know what they had. They never really tested it in humans, and it wasn't until the middle 1970s when it was rediscovered in the United States by a group of therapists and psychiatrists and roughly half a million doses were used in therapeutic settings from the middle 70s to the early 80s. But MDMA escaped out of this therapeutic context and became the recreational drug probably all of us have heard about as ecstasy. And this happened during the time of Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan and the escalation of the drug war. So it was clear that MDMA was going to be criminalized. In the summer of 1984, the DEA moved to put MDMA in Schedule I, criminalizing all medical and recreational use. And a group of advocates and myself banded together, and there's a picture of me in the background spying on the DEA before I walked in the door to take them totally by surprise and demand a hearing. At first, we thought we were winning. We got the hearing. And then the DEA administrative law judge said, we won, that it should remain a therapeutic drug. But the administrator of the DEA rejected the recommendation and placed MDMA in Schedule I, criminalizing all therapeutic as well as recreational use. And so in 1986, I founded a nonprofit pharmaceutical company, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, to try to bring MDMA forward through science, through medicine, and focused on healing. It took 30 years for us to raise the money, to do the studies, to enable us to move to the FDA for what's called an end of phase two meeting. And that's where you 
present your data and you ask for permission to move to phase three, the final stage of research, before you can make a drug into a prescription medicine. And the FDA said yes. Um, <clears throat> now, I'd, I'd like to share with you one story of healing from a 37-year-old veteran, John Lubecki, who was 12 years in the Army and the Marines. And when he came back from Iraq, he was so wounded with trauma that he attempted suicide five times. The last time, he put a gun to his head, he pulled the trigger, and it misfired. And he finally decided to seek help. And he went to the Veterans Administration, and everything they offered him did not work for him. And out of desperation, he volunteered for our study. And our treatment basically consists of three and a half months of treatment with a male-female co-therapy team, but only three administrations of MDMA, one month apart, with 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions, three before the first MDMA session for preparation, and then three after each MDMA session for integration. After the treatment, John wrote, I cannot emphasize how much MDMA-assisted psychotherapy has changed my life. I went from constant, daily suicidal ideation, anxiety, depression, to almost nothing. The best part was this was not lifelong treatment and medication. This was only three experiences of MDMA. PTSD actually changes people's brains. People's amygdala, the, process, the part of our brain where we process fear, becomes hyperactive, and activity is increased there. Where we think logically, the prefrontal cortex, and put experiences in context, activity is reduced, and activity is reduced in the hippocampus where we can put things in long-term memory. MDMA changes people's brains as well, but in the opposite direction. MDMA reduces activity in the amygdala, permitting us to remember traumatic experiences with less fear so that we can process it. MDMA increases activity in the prefrontal cortex where we can store long-term memory, and it increases connectivity between the hippocampus and the amygdala so that memories that are seeming like they're never really in the past can become processed and put into the past. To give you a better sense of how MDMA actually works in therapy, I'm going to show you a two-minute video from one of the therapy sessions, the first therapy session of an Iraq War veteran who, after he came back, was struggling with rage. Try and think of that really rageful aspect of me, like I can't even, I know it's there, but it just doesn't, if... I really feel like so much more at peace with like mm -hmm. everything. Great. Like, even if I try and think about Iraq and everything, like I somehow feel like really peaceful about the fact that that's my journey and that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Part of me think. I mean. I mean, I know this is um, part of the, um, you know, part of the drug, but when I try and think, you know, am I going to be able to hold on to this, um, this understanding and this um, somewhat of wisdom, this knowledge that I have now? I mean, just asking myself that question, I feel like it's so profound that I don't think I could really forget it. Um, this veteran, Nicholas Blackstone, has not forgotten it. This session was almost 10 years ago, and he's still PTSD-free. Uh, to give you a sense of the results that we've got from our phase two studies, the placebo group, the people that received the therapy with either inactive placebo or very low dose MDMA, showed 
actually pretty good results. 23% of them no longer had PTSD after our treatment. That's really pretty good compared to other therapies or compared to the pharmacotherapies. However, when we added MDMA to the therapy, the results more than doubled. 56% of the people no longer had PTSD. And this is really remarkable. These are chronic, severe, treatment-resistant PTSD patients. But what's even better is that this process catalyzed a healing process that people can continue on their own. So at the 12-month follow-up, after the last MDMA session, without any more MDMA, over two-thirds of the people no longer had PTSD. And of the one-third that still had PTSD, many of them had significant reductions in their symptoms. And if we could have gone along to a fourth or fifth session, they might also have gone below the level of having PTSD. On the basis of these results, the FDA granted us breakthrough therapy. It's the most important designation for the most promising drugs. And in a sense now, we are partnered with the FDA on bringing this drug to market as quickly as we can. Um, we've also started negotiations with the European Medicines Agency. On June 12th, this was from this meeting, we were given approval by the EMA to also move to phase three. But in something that both surprised and pleased us, they appealed to us to include refugees and migrants with trauma in our studies, because that's such a problem in Europe. Now, we've also been able to obtain bipartisan support for what we're doing. We've had great coverage in the New York Times, but you may be surprised that we've also had terrific coverage in Fox News. According to a new study, soldiers with PTSD using the illegal drug known as MDMA or ecstasy cured the condition within weeks. This is key because I don't think I've ever seen the word cured in a highfalutin medical journal. Usually it significantly improves, but never cures. Now the study was small, 26 patients, but the message is big. Jess, did you ever think you'd be uh, doing a pro-ecstasy segment on Fox News? No, uh, my mind's spinning right now, and I haven't taken any ecstasy. <laughs> uh, uh, healing trauma and veterans and others is enabling us to build bridges across political divides. We're even able to overcome resistance from the war on drugs. In essence, the war on drugs has never been about drug abuse. It's been about the persecution of minorities, and it's been about the suppression of the freedom of thought, of cognitive liberty. And it's also caused enormous unnecessary suffering by the suppression of research with drugs such as MDMA, marijuana, psilocybin, and many others. Fortunately, MAPS has been able to raise $27 million in donations, not investments, but in donations, to start phase three research, which we're going to be starting next month. We anticipate by 2021 that we will have MDMA available as a medicine, and we'll actually be able to start using it with patients on a compassionate basis a year from now. And we anticipate the same for EMA, depending on our ability to raise funding for the European research. For those heroes in the audience here and watching and around the world who have struggled for human rights, for freedom against oppressive regimes, for whom resilience is a constant struggle. The message today is that there is hope and there is healing. Thank you.